Come. <clears throat> you ever think about a pyramid? The way that a pyramid is designed is to basically... I'm glad I'm wearing the hat. Just take it in the back. All right. If you think a way that, about the way that the pyramid is designed, a pyramid... <laughs> I was like, how do you even preach after that? <laughs> We'll have to edit that out of the homily. That's like the... All right. Spraznikov. All right. If you think about the way that a pyramid is designed, a pyramid is designed in order to disperse the weight, right? You have one layer on the bottom, but since you have so many subsequent layers uh, or levels, you could say, there's an overwhelming amount of weight, and that weight has to go somewhere, and so you create basically a bigger base and the design behind the bigger base is that it would disperse the weight so as not to crush the base, right? But what's interesting in the church, and we often talk about this, or we could even just say it, what we notice in society is that a lot of society is kind of built in the same manner as a pyramid, right? You have many people or many workers, and yet you have only one person uh, or one kind of uh, soul uh, authority figure up near the top. In fact, this is why when we look at uh, companies, a lot of times it's, it's often kind of shocking where you'll have, you know, let's say a company that has the average employee makes, you know, $60,000 a year or something, and the CEO makes the same as 100 employees or 200 employees, you know, with stock options and benefits and everything else. They're making like $10 million, right? So it's like, it ends up throwing out the whole equation of like who's actually serving who because the disbursement of money is like so completely out of proportion, right? Those who are near the top are actually raking in huge amounts of money, huge profits, whereas everyone along the bo on the on the bottom is like basically barely sustaining themselves. You know, they're like barely making a living wage. <clears throat> Sorry, I can't. Uh, in this way, we often see that this is kind of, I would almost say, the default structure for how you see much of life and much of society, which is the people who are strong or powerful or people who have power often want to elevate themselves near the top and they want to utilize this power, not in order to serve other people or to take care of them or whatever else, but in order to increase their own wealth or good standing or their power themselves. In fact, you know, the old joke about... Uh, you know, American society is like, what's the quickest way or the easiest way to become wealthy? And it's get into politics, right? Like, and that's not just a joke, but if you actually look at the numbers of people, you'll see somebody who came into politics with a net worth of like $50,000. And then within five years, their net worth is like $1.5 million. And you're thinking like, their salary is not that. So how are they doing that? You know? Uh, you look at people who are long-term in politics and somehow they accumulate even tens of millions of dollars while they seemingly only get paid by taxpayers at most, you know, 150-ish thousand a year. I think, I think people in the Senate only make like 200,000 a year or 180 or something like this. And, and, and then that's not only, I mean, that's, that's a good income, but you can't generate, you know, multiple million dollars of worth off of an income like that. It, it's impossible, right? So the whole point is, is that you're utilizing your power and your influence and your position in order to curry favor with people who are also higher up in order to kind of keep everyone else at a certain level so that you're able to rise up. That's what we see in society. We see it in business. We see it in politics. We see it in our society. The interesting thing is that the church is the inverse of this. It is, it is, we often talk about the pyramid that is flipped upside down. It's the inverted pyramid. And what we mean by that is not that Christ stands at the peak of the pyramid ruling down over all the people, right? But rather that Christ takes himself and puts himself at the bottom of the pyramid and the weight of all the people of the whole church rests on him. And on him, he places the apostles, the preachers, evangelists, martyrs, confessors, ascetics. He places people there in order to bear this weight. In fact, in Ephesians today, we read in the epistle, the first line, brethren, 
unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. What is this? This is often mistaken in Western theology. So if you have a background in Western theology, you hear grace and you hear like unmerited favor, these sort of things, right? But this is actually not the manner in which St. Paul uses this terminology. When St. Paul uses the word grace, he's speaking specifically of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling and the measure of the Holy Spirit. In fact, when we read in the book of Acts, we often see that there isn't one measure of the Holy Spirit. Not all Christians are given one measure of the Holy Spirit. Rather, Christians are giving a measure of the Holy Spirit according to their calling, according to what they are supposed to be doing in Christ Jesus. And so it is that he says, listen, you are given a grace, meaning an indwelling of the Holy Spirit, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, does this mean that people have more or less of the Holy Spirit? Well, of course, the theology of churches know when somebody receives the Holy Spirit, they receive all of the Holy Spirit. In fact, they receive so much of the Holy Spirit that there is a potentiality in every single Christian for them to become a great saint. This is what we would talk about as being the grace of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. Being activated, right? So it's not that we receive <coughs> more or less in terms of quantity, what we're talking about is the more or less that is, we could say, manifested through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Of course, when we would say, well, I would desire greater grace or more grace, what is the answer from the Holy Fathers? The Holy Fathers are always telling us, strive harder, put in more work, show yourself to be a diligent workman. Those who put forth the effort, those who put forth the struggle, are also rewarded in like kind with greater grace, right? Now, this is, again, the manifestation or the activation of the grace that is dwelling within the person. And he goes on to say at the end, and he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Notice again this imagery, right? That it is for the edification or the perfecting of the saints. And who are the saints? Of course, he's saying, and the generalized term, all Christians, right? All Orthodox Christians are the body of Christ. And it is given to those who have these special roles as apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors. It is given to them to uphold and to edify, to edify the body of Christ. This is why we show such respect to our hierarchs, even to our priests. Why? Because they carry a tremendous burden. We don't have a clergy that is detached from the people and lords itself over the people and kind of rules over the church. That is not the imagery. And that's not what we experience even in practicality, right? In practicality, what do we see? We see that the clergy of our, of, of the, of our church take on the cares, the concerns, the burdens, the sins of the people, right? They are often the ones who are, in a sense, weighed down with everything that is happening in the life of the church. Because, you know, you may say, well, I have this struggle in my life, or I'm going through a rough patch, and you may not know that there's four or five or six other people, right? But the priest knows that. The priest carries this burden silently within himself, right? He doesn't share it with anybody else. He doesn't share it with his matushka. He doesn't share it, you know, in a sense with anybody, obviously, in the parish or any of these things, right? The, the priest, the clergy, they put themselves at the bottom of this inverted triangle in order to be crushed down, and yet they are strengthened by the stature, the fullness of Christ. It is actually this kind of incredible miracle that takes place that, you know, we think about this when we, even when we talk about making diamonds, right? How are diamonds made? Through intense pressure. And so it is that it's not that when we experience intense pressure that it crushes us unto our oblivion, you know, into our annihilation. It doesn't destroy us. That's the idea of the world. The, uh, the idea of the world is like, oh, all this stress or whatever, all this pressure is killing me. This is too much. 
in, 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 in our faith, this is not our view. Our view is this intense responsibility to take on the cares and the concerns of the people around us does not crush us or destroy us. It purifies us. It makes us more like Christ because Christ is at the very bottom of the pyramid. So the greater the burden, the greater the struggle, the greater the striving, the more the person becomes purified and like Christ. This is why even you could say an easy example of something like in the life of St. Paisios, when the war broke out in the Middle East and Iraq, he said this, he had this intense sense that, that, that war would break out all over the world because of this. And so he dedicated, I think for two years, basically to being in his cell and just praying for the peace of the whole world. And like ceaseless prayer, I mean, you can't imagine what a struggle and what an asceticism he undertook, a burden for the whole world in order that peace would be preserved. <clears throat> How else do we see this vision of the inverted triangle that we see kind of perfected in the life of the church? Well, the other place that we see it most abundantly and most readily is what? In the family. This is the vision of a Christian family. The vision of the Christian family is what? Christ is at the very bottom of the pyramid. He is always the one on which we build and grow and have our foundation, right? But then who's, who comes after Christ? The husband, right? The father of the family puts himself down in that role, in that position of being crushed. And then on top of him, right, the wife and then the children and the needs of the family. We often have this kind of a misunderstanding. I see this especially in kind of Western Christianity where the idea is like when people say, oh, the husband is the head of the family or he's like, you know, uh, 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 whatever. Like th th this is kind of like this vision of leadership that is completely divorced, <coughs> excuse me, from the image of Christ. Christ's leadership, him being God incarnate, was not to come on earth and to rule mankind and to make everyone subject to him. That's not what he did. He came lowly, meek, and humble, and as a servant. This does not mean that the husband lets everybody kind of walk all over him, right? That's not healthy and that's not normal. But the idea is the servant leadership that we see in the life of the church with Christ is the same servant leadership that we see in the life of the family. In fact, even with the mother, when the mother feels that she is being kind of crushed and, and weighed down by the cares of the children and the difficulties of parenting, who does she rely on? She relies on the husband, right? She gives and she tells her burden to her husband. She seeks to find relief and companionship and help from him. It's one of the things that like somebody... Uh, one time I was talking with, and they were talking to me. I can't remember the context. I, I think it was like pastoral counseling, but marital counseling or something. But I said to them, I don't share much or any of my problems or my needs with my wife. And they thought, you know, like, this is very strange. Like, what do you mean? You know, it's not that I don't tell my wife anything that's going on with me or how I'm generally doing, but I don't rely on my wife to be my emotional support, my emotional crutch. I don't rely on her to solve the problems that I'm facing or the difficulties that I'm facing. I don't rely on her as a friend. My wife is not my friend. My wife is my wife. If I need help or support from a friend, what do I do? I call another man, right? Or I go to my spiritual father. And I ask him for a direction. I ask him for these things. Why? Because the understanding of being a husband, of being a man, is that you're accessible to everyone else's needs and cares and burdens. You know, your wife is not your accountability partner. She's not your friend. She's not your, you know, people like, she's not the rock that you lean on. That's not what a wife is. The husband fulfills those roles because he takes on that place of intense pressure and difficulty in the life of the family. He allows everyone else to rely on him, while in turn, he does not rely on the family. He doesn't rely on his wife to affirm him or to tell him that he's 
good or doing a good job or a good husband or this or that or the other, right? The whole role of the husband is not that he's separate from the family in the sense that he's like distinct, but that he is in such a place of servitude that everything he does is for the benefit of the family. And is this, you know, is this a place of intense pressure? You know, is this a place of intense hardship? Yes. Yes, it is. This is like, we often forget that husbands need more prayer. They need to go to monasteries more often. They need fellowship and brotherhood within the church more. Why? Because they carry such an intense burden. They have such an intense pressure put on them. In fact, when you look at male culture in America, the reason that male culture in America is falling apart and that men in general are falling apart. I mean, we have the, the highest rates of suicide are among men. And it's like, why is that? One, because men have failed to rely on God. That's number one. And then number two, because they don't have a brotherhood. They don't have a fellowship with other men. You know why? Because they don't go to church. So the only kind of brotherhood that the world offers is like, maybe if you have a hobby or a sport or whatever... But all of that stuff is trite and meaningless and superficial. You, there's no depth there. There's no kind of real camaraderie. There's no real depth to any of American culture. I'm not saying American culture is all bad. I'm just saying it's very shallow, very superficial. The depth of the spiritual life is found in the life of the church. And in this way, <clears throat> men need each other to strengthen each other to bear this burden. This, brothers and sisters, is what we see in the model of the church, and we see this in the model of the family. <clears throat> and what we need to be doing and making sure us as husbands is that we are strengthening and that we are encouraging and that we are uplifting our families, that we are uplifting the church, uplifting those around us, and that in this way, when Christ sees us struggling with this measure, he gives us the grace, that we receive the grace of the Holy Spirit in order to bear these awesome burdens that we face. If we have the grace, what do we hear from Christ? My burden is light, and my yoke is easy. If we're doing it all on our own, stressed about our money, stressed about this, stressed about that, no, no God in sight, what happens? We fall apart, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. What happens to men? They fall apart. They try to play God, or they try to do everything without God's help. And what happens? They're a wreck. They're a wreck. That's why we see soaring, soaring rates of you know, alcoholism and self-destructive behavior and depression and all these things. Why? Because man needs God. He needs him to receive that grace in order to strengthen him for the awesome burden of being a husband, of being a father, of being, what do we even say? a pillar in the community. Even when we use that language, the idea, right, was what? A pillar held things up. That's what a pillar did. A pillar was for the strengthening of the entire edifice. So it is, brothers in Christ, I encourage you, rely on one another, accept the awesome yoke and burden of being a husband, of being a father, of doing these things in a righteous and godly way, accept and find the grace of the Holy Spirit and work together as brothers in Christ to strengthen each other so that the whole church may be lifted up so that it can thrive and grow to the glory of Christ Jesus our God. Amen.